We want a peace. Where are you accepting? We got a unity. Your actions left us with the last of all delusions. Hope. Torture of ambition. Hey, let me tell you something. Skyrim has mods for every single one of your needs. You don't need a life. You don't even need to touch grass when you have 4K resolution grass in a video game. And what is the purpose of going outside if the outside I get to see while staying inside is better than the one I have to go outside to see? But just between you and me, I don't get the fascination with grass. Sure, it's a weird looking green plant that has a valuable place in many ecosystems, but I wouldn't endlessly mod Skyrim around something which is primary faction is to get eaten by a cow. No, what we want is new DLCs for the game. Beyond Reach is one of such mods. Back in my younger days, I played this mod, and back then it felt shallow. Incomplete. Then after I posted the original video, a viewer by the name of Amazing Horizons expanded my horizons by telling me that the mod is now longer, voice acted, and has some themes that are apparently darker than Vigilance. Impossible. Blasphemous even. Okay, I'll give it a shot. I mean, I have nothing better to do for the weekend, might as well throw some time out of the window. Okay, one week, two playthroughs, and three pages worth of notes later, and yeah, I think I want to talk about this mod. What made me change my mind? Well, for one, this mod is now voice actor, meaning you won't just hear my voice for the next three hours. Secondly, this mod dwells into, I think, most of the weirder topics of Elder Scrolls lore that I have yet to cover on this channel. And thirdly, the mod is good. Beyond mixing a lot of different subjects from test lore, it also uses a lot of different themes you see in fiction, such as motherhood, power struggles, and most importantly, hope, which will be the key point of this mod story. All these themes are then beautifully tied up in a gloomy, dark and mysterious atmosphere, which is why today I am here to spill the tea on this mod story. But before that, some disclaimers. This is going to be a long video about Beyond the Reach, in which I will spoil most things about the main quest and a few things about side quests. So here is your spoiler warning. I will not talk about every side quest or every detail of the main story, as a lot of points really don't push the mod's narrative. Beyond this, however, one of the biggest problems people have with this mod is that there is way too much dialogue and these dialogues often use very abstract terminologies, so much so that they become gibberish after one point. So I will also be skipping some of them when I'm able to explain them without the need to have them play for 45 minutes. On top of that, like I said already, this mod requires understanding of some of the more difficult parts of Tesla. So again, when we get to those points, I'm gonna have to pause, elaborate on what's happening and then continue. Also, that whole darker than vigilant comment, yeah? It's true. Advance at your own peril. If you thought what happened to Lemay was bad, there's a lot more of it here, along with other acts against mankind. Finally, I feel the need to remind people that I have never ever gotten anything wrong when it comes to Skyrim mods. Emperor Balthazar? Yeah, he's right here. Look at him. We're besties now. Dregs of si Dregs of Sithis? I barely know her. In all seriousness, I am confident for about 95% of the things I will talk about in this mod. There are however one or two things that I have my doubts on. This mod is way less documented or explained than some of the other subjects I cover on this channel. So mostly I had to piece this all together. And if I get something wrong or if you want to add something that I skipped, please feel free to do so in the comments. And with all that out of the way, let's go to White Run, meet a blind priestess and set a course for a path beyond the reach. You? What are you? Please, take Mother Mara's blessing to wash this unease away. What are you talking about? Mother guides me to those flickering souls who are yet to cast themselves on the fire for tomorrow's utopia. She sees in you potential, potential which can avert calamity. I, her most devoted servant, need you to believe in the goodness of your heart, in love. Get to the point. Forgive her beloved child of entropy. For all her conviction, she only looks up, blind to those below the clouds which she wishes to ascend. There is a terror, a terror of minds and ideas forming in the West. A congliage of antipathy and repressed hatred is nearing its sun. Go West and see. Open those eyes and see that which belies its splendor. Beset by men, gods, kings, and ideas. Keep a clear eye. Keep your head above water when you reach that realm. The tides of want can drown any who venture too far from the shore. Her bodyguard tells us that they hail from the reach and that right now there is a merchant in Markath who can take us there. The merchant hides us as his bodyguard since the last one got drunk and lost and off we go to the kingdom of Evermore. There is this introduction that you can see on the screen right now 
and it's just mindless foreshadowing, so I'm not gonna go through it. Beyond the Ridge contains very disturbing and sensitive subjects. Huh. I don't find this ominous at all. Also, check it out. I upgraded. No longer will people make fun of me for playing on Legendary Edition. I didn't have time to go through a lot of graphical improvement mods, but this ought to make the experience a little bit more palatable for your eyes. However, if you are planning to pick up this mod, I ought to give you this word of advice. This mod doesn't really like being around other mods. I played it once without any other mods, and I had only one crash. Then I played it twice to record this video with other visual mods, and I had about 10 crashes, one complete freeze in which I had to restart the PC, and a lot of visual anomalies. Now, welcome to the Reach. We are here. What is Evermore? Evermore is renowned most of all for its colourful cast of characters and deviants. You'll run the gamut of Bretonic experience in that cluster of man. First settlement you'll come across, considering you stay the course once you depart from a wagon, is the Divide, a hulking bridge jutting out from its watery locale. Standing atop that stony juggernaut will grant you a vista of the Reach's mires and towns, most notably Arnhema, and if you squint hard enough, Evermore itself. I thought Evermore was the kingdom. <laughs> Semantics, eh? <clears throat> Evermore is the city and the kingdom, where the city itself beats as the heart and centre of our royal affairs. The place where the Reach consolidates its authority and... well, Reach over the east. Used to be a backwater not too long ago, the Eastern Hinterland Kingdom. Yet recent times have spoiled the city with inordinate wealth and power. Power that they've used to conquer and subjugate their comparatively less civilised neighbours. Now any Breton dwelling east of the city's walls sports their banner. You'll see it on your arrival. What's going on in Armina? Nothing pleasant, I assure you. Most outside their miserable sty consider it to be a stain on the kingdom, with good reason. Most of the guards are nothing but thugs looking to shake down us humble merchants when given the chance, and they routinely terrorise those unfortunate sons they don't have the means to leave. All governed by that strange character, Mortifane. Lord Mortifane, to be correct. Never call a lord by his name. Heard tales of sordid acts and strange punishment disseminated upon those beneath him, who weren't wise enough to escape. The merchant tells us that there is this new breed of force one roaming the lands called the Witchmen, who are a lot more powerful than their Skyrim and counterparts, and wouldn't you know it, but one of them just attacked the local tower. Not sure how you came out of that alive, to be honest. You're tougher than you look. Bro, I am literally wearing Konachrik. What do you mean I'm tougher than I look? And from here we part ways with the merchant and head over to the first settlement, the Divide. Or not, the map opens up from here. The world is now our oyster. On the way we see a bunch of work refugees leaving the Reach. Why is this happening? There's been hatred against my kind in these lands for the longest time. But with that Orsinium sons reigning and causing their stir among the Bretons, the retaliation from the Manmer will most likely have orcs like me in the crossfire. We were assured that we'd be safe here, under the protection of the Empire, and that our skills would be appreciated by the locals. But now the Empire is weak, and the Bretons grow angry. We don't want to tempt fate by sticking around. And here is the divide. So now that we made it to the first settlement, I want to mention some things about the atmosphere of this game. When you enter the divide, the crier of the city is out there talking about what is happening to the region. Apparently, the region suffers from the Witchmen, orcs that are ravaging the countryside, a plague that is especially deadly to manners and the elderly, pirates from the Iliac Bay, floodings which have destroyed an entire settlement, a Dereni ruin named Grey Balmor has a curse inside it which might spread all over the region, necromancers, and another settlement was destroyed right outside the divide from mysterious reasons. Needless to say, this region is hitting rock bottom. There are three major settlements and all three of them look very off. The divide is a shack on a bridge, Armina is a shack, period, and Evermore is guarded by a magical barrier 24-7. Even the few signs of beauty in this region seem kind of... well, how should I put this? Oh, I know. Have you ever passed by a beautiful neighborhood that seemed clean and neat at all, but as you look closer you start to notice a few things going a bit off, like every house having security cameras, electric fences, and the windows having iron bars in front of them? Well, that's what the rich feels when it's not a complete dump, so we go to the town shrine and we talk to the lord of the settlement, Merosa. A lookout tower was sacked by witchmen. Oh, a harbinger of grim news. Not the best first impression. Well, 
Thank you for telling me in advance of my own guards. It was only a matter of time before they spilled further east. I'm just a messenger. Pardon the introduction, yet understand the need for it. We can't have any wandering yokel approach royalty like they're of the same stock. It's not good for the kingdom's image. We'll have the guard there as soon as possible. But for you, are you interested in some coin? We need someone to talk to us. What do you need done? Yes, well, onto the matter. To the east of this bridge lies the town of Arnima, formerly Raven Spring, lest you run into a resident whose mind is stuck in bygone years. From there, she tells us to go find a man named Jagos in Armina to ask him about any potential rumors regarding the Witchman. However, the really interesting part happens when you ask her about the origins of these Witchmen. I'm no expert nor historian, but what I can tell you should be the same that every reach man would recite when speaking of those savages. Accounts state that this new incarnation of the witch man appeared near two decades back, just after the incident at Monstor. What happened in Monstor? You haven't heard of it either. I feel like I'll be going over the history of every blade of grass in the reach. I digress. Monstor was an abandoned fort, far to the north, that has since succumbed to its frozen locale. Peasants, serfs, and other seditious souls had made a great exodus under the cover of night, all leaving their fields, abandoning the lords they were sworn to serve. Of course, when all your labor, thus wealth, absconds in but a moment, there will be tremors. So the lords had sent men to trail these wayward workers all the way to Monstor. What they saw was an ostensibly bizarre affair, both witchmen and peasants forming a decadent commune, many turning to layabouts who engaged in petty pleasures and shirking the labor that had made them. Those witchmen don't look like the kind you want to live with. I see you're not one for absorbing the finer details of a conversation. This was before they had all turned feral. Not to say they weren't savage before, but that former identity was ultimately harmless, unlike those you see now. Panic-stricken, many lords conspired, finally pushing for the siege that would be that commune's undoing. Cutting of food, digging extensive tunnels to both poison their wells and revealing more avenues for attack. Lastly, clear diplomacy to impart some reason into those serfs. Enough for them to return to civilization and abandon these naive ideals. The lords saw the beneficiaries within Monstor. A gathering of hag ravens who were prolonging the siege to impossible lengths. Then crumbs of discontent were found among a militia. Fear gripped the nobility that these ideas could spread to every serf. Nobility, not just from Evermore, but from all over High Rock, sent aid when they heard how severe the crisis was. All of High Rock seemingly united to crush this small town. Yet only a Luddite would think so simply. This was to crush an idea, a canker that'd undo the very world we haven. So the Lord's strength was honed into one blow, throwing all their might at those walls. They fell, and what mercy we would have spared upon those misguided serfs was instead replaced with conviction to stamp out a chaotic ideology. Wait, you killed the serfs? I? No. They, however, did. To the last man, woman and child. A pyrrhic victory in the truest sense. Evermore had lost half its serf class, yet the lords were elated that the existential crisis of revolution was averted. Exceptionally harsh measures were put in place for anyone that even uttered the commune's name, or who dared to evoke the same rebellious sentiments. And so that concludes the tale of Monstor. How does that connect to the Witchman? Bear with me as what follows can drift into conjecture. Rumors from the nobility in that siege reported seeing figures watching the slaughter unfold in the town. 
neither part of the kingdom's militia or the defendants. Scouts were dispatched to see who the strange party was, and upon their return they displayed strange idols, with the scouts claiming them as gifts from those shady silhouettes, though their names or identities were never disclosed. Most of the nobility had discarded these charms immediately, except for that wretched Mortifane, who was enamored by that hideous amulet that still wrings his filthy neck. And what happened next? In the years that followed the siege, people had brought news of slaughter among the witchmen upon themselves. Not merely a civil war as such, but a purging. Seemed not one sane pagan was left up north, and that's when communication from the posts in their land stopped. Silence had blanketed their profaned realm. Until recently. Monster is gonna become very important later in the story, so I thought I would let most of this talk play out. And actually, there are quite a few events that are important to this story that took place years before what is happening right now, so we'll have to also keep them in mind. The priest of this temple also tells us that the disease was first spotted amongst the witchmen, and is currently unsure whether this illness was natural or of daedric origins. When you try to leave the divide, the Solomon gets attacked by a bunch of undead. Going after the necromancer that summoned them takes us to the ruined village that Cryo talked about. Finding and killing the necromancer, and his notes reveal that he was actually trying to cast a massive spell on the Solomon, which malfunctioned and ended up blowing the Solomon instead. It also mentions that he is part of a group, and his master would be very mad if he finds out he did this. Hunting down this group, and we found out that his master is actually a slowed. I think this is a good time to mention how questing works in this mod. There are three different types of quests in this mod. The main quest, optional side quests that run in parallel to the main quest and essentially expand on the characters and settings of the main quest, and side quests that expand on the world of the reach at this time. The third type of quest might seem a bit out of place, but they help slap you back into reality. Unlike other adventure mods, this mod for the most part isn't played on some grand scale for the fate of the world. For most of the main quest, it's all about the fate of one kingdom in a single province of Tamriel, for the most part at least. So it's always nice when this game throws these quests at you to remind you that there's a greater picture here. A quest about a member of the Blades going rogue after the White Cold Concordat, the Thalmo conspiring with the Orcs to destabilize the region, and necromancers enlisting the help of a Slode, paint a wider picture to an otherwise very local affair. His greatest want was to become like the deities he worshipped. But try as he may, no wings ever sprouted. Oh, my dude, I know a guy just like that. Damn, a lot of people want to become dragons lately, huh? However, as you will come to see if you play this mod, the main quest is complete. However, a lot of these side activities have wider implications that are not being elaborated on because this mod is still being developed. So don't expect an answer about this whole slow thing just yet. Maybe in a year or two. Anyway, moving on with the main quest, we find Jagos in Armina. I was sent by someone on the bridge to see if you needed any help. Got ourselves a spy. Could find yourself at the end of a rope, if you're lucky. Yeah, I know who you're talking of. Tell her that a helping hand is more than welcome. She'll get the gist. Before I forget myself as someone of meagre authority, take this letter as well. The seal is meant to keep prime fingers out so she'll know if you start sticking your nose in. Anything else? What? Want to take me to dinner? Just make sure you get back to her safely. If you ever feel your safety compromised, make sure to leave no trace of that letter. That's all the blood that follows will be on your hands, not mine. Why haven't you done anything about Mortifane already? Got your blinders on? Plans have a tendency for being outed upon leaving your lips here. We've got ears all round town. They get the way an extra septum for themselves by getting on the Lord's good side. Besides, our hands are ultimately tied through forces beyond Mortifane. What do you mean? There's a larger fear among the royalty in this province for uppity peasants than mad tyrants. We don't want to be setting any precedents with our unruliness now. And so our only ally is time. Waiting for the Lord to pass on for a more just ruler to reign. The knowing the reach is a hope based in fantasy. We shouldn't talk about this further. A man has to be cautious if he wants to keep his head. If you ask him about the Witchman, he tells you that the reason why there's so many of them is because a lot of people from different settlements of the Reach are beginning to defect and join them. And how could they not? Mortifane is a mad ruler who kills people who do as much as breathe their own way around him, the Divide is a shark, and Evermore is close to anyone who isn't Reach AF. We go back to Marosa, and she tells us to go talk to the Imperial Captain in the Reach for a job. 
and the job is to push a Banovolks called Sons of Orsinium away from their current positions. This part is pretty skippable, so instead of showing you a filler quest, I want to actually explain the motives of the orcs behind all this. See, the history of the orcs can be summarized in a pretty simple cycle. They build Orsinium, something something happens, Orsinium falls, something something happens, they rebuild it, something something happens, repeat. And in the 4th era, Orsinium was sacked again by a combined force of Bretons and Redguards. Reasons for this vary between the Empire being very weak at the time and unable to work to protect the city, severe racial tensions between Redguards, Bretons and Orcs, and civil unrest amongst the Orcs themselves. So naturally, the cycle repeats itself. And this time, a group of orcs called the Sons of Orsinium have sought to get revenge against the races that have destroyed their home, and pave the way for another Orsinium. Coming back to the commander after killing the orcs, and he gives us a bounty to help Mortify get back his lost amulet, which she got from those shady characters after the Siegin monster. Just two days ago, my guard put in a small group of witchmen just outside the city walls. The first time in a while they've come this close. They butchered all but one that left for the hills deep within the valley, and by coincidence, a necklace of mine went missing. Can you just get another one? Hearing you speak of such relics like they were common jewels makes me sick. This amulet is what keeps you and this town safe. I shouldn't become riled with naivety. Now if you go, lest you forfeit the gold you desire and forgo the safety you'll have within my walls. Here I also want to mention another problem with this mod. It is voice actor, but about 15% of the voice acting is missing. So I'll have to read some dialogue myself. So for example, if you ask Mortify what the witchman want with the amulet, he will reply by saying, They stole it for something very sinister, that I cannot dream of in my wildest nightmares. There is a spectre of evil glooming this town, hungering for the day that these walls might fall, and we're all feasted upon by something most ugly. So we go find the amulet, and we find out that the witchmen have also been uncovering old tyranny ruins for some reason. Then, upon leaving the ruins, someone decides to throw some foreshadowing down our way. This is probably the best part to talk about the actual difficulty of this mod. You see, unlike Vigilant where the difficulty was a bunch of big chungases with badass themes, the difficulty in Beyond the Rage is centered around throwing a lot of enemies at you, and those enemies that debuffing you with poison or weakness. They can be pretty annoying at times, and they can also eat through your health bar very quickly. Thankfully, I made a new best friend recently, and he was more than happy to show me a whole host of different spells for such a situation. You see, one fine day, as I was walking outside the reach, I found this weird looking door that I had never seen before, and inside said door, I found the most beautiful little creek, and right next to that creek, there was a well. Inside said well, I met a guy called Janal the Black Owl. He said something about chic traders or something. Um, I don't care about poetry that much, I just ignored it. So I just got a bunch of spells from him, gave him a handshake and left. Huh, maybe I should have asked him why he was living so close to an orphan. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah, bringing the amulet back to Mortifei. So after we do that he just tells us to piss off and we go to the local priest that informs us that some of the relics of the hero of Evermore, a guy named Maros, had been stolen by a mysterious thief. And thanks to the help of a new missionary who is skilled at alteration magic, they were able to be located. Maros himself was a warrior of Mara that served and died for the rich, and his relics seemed to have some kind of divine energy in them. So we go find the relics that are in Grey Balmor, you know, that haunted place that Cryer told us about, and then this happens. You are being haunted. That which pursues you will not die by conventional means. You must run. Search for your objective and escape. Wait, huh? A monster then appears and begins hunting the player. The monster is a skeleton that can teleport anywhere out of thin air, but what is more interesting about it is its name. It is called the Wayward Brother. So we retrieve the ring and we go to the thief's room to dispel the curse. The thief's journal reads as follows. Stories about a great upset reign in my dreams. A hateful rebellion against it all. Not just a king or a man, 
but the whole world. Any thinking will be made equal to the filth of her dominion. I will see that this will come to pass. The dreaming gives me a vision, a voice telling me my purpose. She needs a ring from the temples, and I'm not to question why, as the dream shows me what comes from this small crime. The ruin is motive enough to have your every action, your every trauma read before you lay upon the world. This is the question of will. I will spite against the idea of our enslavement. I have seen the civilizations who once called the rich their own and I'm guided to another one in the north. They tell me the story of every civilization hence, that of thinking beings capturing the natural law of will, foundations for all they built, masters and slaves beyond our words and our wants. It is this, power. Not one of them can escape that law. The laws for we men, yet for something we believe separate and divine, love, to spread ourselves through time and progeny. Yet with my small crime, that juggernaut of life and its laws will fall. I will elaborate more on the thief's identity later, but for now I just want you to keep in mind this thief and the wayward brother. They are both very important. Bringing the ring back to the priest and Montefay tells us that the missionary has made an important discovery we should investigate. Do you need any help? Well, before any action, you should know a little about me, particularly of what I do. You see, I'm not here just to spread the divine's wisdom. I'm here because the priest requested my skills. Alteration, to be exact. Anyway, why is alteration so important here? I bring this up because one technique I've found is to discover large tracts of land for things both significant and relevant to our interest. And recently my focus has been on one such thing. Gauntlets belonging to the blessed and venerated war knight, Maddos. The items have vanished and no one had any answers as to where. Until now, of course, with the help of yours truly. Well, where are they? Far to the north, way beyond this kingdom's grasp. Most strange is how far below the earth my search took me to. Right in the depths of that Dwemer ruin. How did they get there? My abilities only go so far, friend. If I were able to peer into the past, then most of our problems would be solved. Unless we deal with what we're handed. Yet we can rule out a number of suspects who could hazard that voyage. Start, at least. No, oh my. Going on about the whys and wheres is quite the digression. What were we talking about again? What do you need me for? <laughs> right, of course. Uh, well, seeing as you've returned seemingly unscathed from that perilous delve, would you be interested in yet another journey? I also want to mention the interaction with this former statue right outside the ruin. Even in the most degenerate form, the slave had covered delusions that his master was good. Without his tutelage, uncertainty. The slave finally forgoes thought and accepts fully what pride suppressed. Bondage is destiny. All the praxis used by the master hitherto had fostered a fear in the slave, greater than the torture of its servitude. That uncertainty was the worst of all prospects, so the master leads the torch, battling against the great unseen, all the while holding firm his chain. Inside the ruins and the... Uh... You can really tell that this mod doesn't like being around other graphic mods that much. Just look at the state of this chamber. Below the ruin we find the sentry of this facility, and he has this to say. Interplane gate platform. Warning gate compromised during hibernation. Warning breach occurred five neuron cycles prior to current events. Gate mechanics for the portal can only be operated by myself and where biological. Relaying arcane footage from Centurion. Biological possessed black item discerning items function and agent's agenda item seems to be worn on the hand. Agent's motive is unknown. Extremely hazardous materials will be encountered through your expedition into subject realm number 137. So we pull some levers and the sentry opens the portal. The portal is definitely the Aedric. It seems to be like one of those of Dagon's, but the color scheme when we open the portal is different. And right next to the portal, there is a dead spider harvester and Merun's Dagon does not use harvesters. And indeed, when we get to the portal, this place really doesn't look like the Deadlands, but we can find Manos' gauntlets here, along with a corpse of something called the Wanting Stillborn, and the last tire of the thief, which reads, Finally here, accepted, the quill still draws in my mind, for she has taken fingers, arm, head and heart. But this sacred paper concludes the story, riding in this belly. She uses me for new contents, destroying old hopes, a mercy. Here is evil, here is ugly, here is the end, here is home, true, now content, now peace. As we shall leave this place, we find a creature called the Wayward Ego waiting for us by the portal. There you are, the one to shatter this crimson cage and grant me freedom. What are you? The Liberator wants a name, a moniker for this transient form. Well, you can call me Ambition. I am what I feel, like any man. I am compelled, Liberator. Pull towards 
even at once with great force. I desire converged upon my gods, lords, and men. That want is power. When the corpse king, rotting it up his spire needs a prince. And who better to take up that venerated role than ambition? Clearly. Yes, strip away the artifice and cast away pretension. Forgive my joy, Liberator, becoming aware of a destiny rewritten has made me giddy. Yes, it has. What is that thing behind you? Kill something? If we could only inflict death to the dead, to ameliorate that contradiction would cease my struggle. Yet it cannot be. However, there is another who could be the source of your malice. An anchor to ambition, the bank of remembering. Out of my way, I don't want to talk to you anymore. We will meet again, Liberator, and I will be pleased to see you. Everything that is ugly, everything that is weak, will all be burned away. And you will join me in this growth. Where I had gone from scum to royalty, you will go from nomad to nobility. Then. I know that between this, The Wayward Brother and The Thief, you probably have a lot of questions right now, but don't worry, all questions will be answered, in due time. So we get out of the portal right after that thing, and the missionary seems just as shocked as we were about it. Bloody ma- I almost took her name in vain. What in all the hells was that? Now when we get back, the priest tells us to attend a meeting between Lord Mortifei and a counselor from the Divide, as Mortifei has been robbing and kicking terrors from the region, something which has impoverished both this region and the Divide. The presence of these gauntlets within such a remote ruin should have been reason enough to amplify concern. Yet now Daedra have been brought into the fold. Are we but unwitting pawns in some grander scheme? Yes, you don't say! But before we get to that... I choose you! Um, excuse me? Garth told me I can choose a protector if I agree to come up with him to see the big bird. And so, I choose you. People said you're a strong fighter, so you can protect us from anything that comes at us when we see Lord Griffin. Big Bird, Lord Griffin, Child, who are these people? Not people, silly. Haven't you seen the Griffin? It's finally here. It was gone for so long, but now it's back. And Garth said I could be the first to see it. So, will you join us? Please? So we go to her carrier, and he says that he's going to take this girl to go see the griffin. Do you have any reservations with escorting? I and the girl you've greeted are in need of armed company. Worry yourself no longer, Selzord. After this, you'll have your fortune. 
Here, your map. The little one and I will await your arrival at the cliff edge here. Do not dally. We've not much time till the griffin departs again. He also has this to say about the griffin. The griffin doesn't entertain itself with the fears of Lowborn. The griffin is only riled through great heresy or treason. Their marble figure found in every city, their presence felt by every loyal subject. The kingdom owes its strength to them, the most divine of Marwa's creations, imbued with her undying generosity. This very griffin we're yet to see hasn't graced our land for near twenty years. Having departed after sundering an uprising of heretical peasants. Wait, what do you mean heretical peasants? Attempted a little commune together, a heinous sight, a direct violation of divine authority. They say that even wives were shared up there. Eventually, our most revered nobility took it upon themselves to end the madness and disseminated great justice upon the wretches. So, in case this hasn't spelled sus to you yet, this is what actually happens when we escort them all the way to the Griffin. Hmm, I am pleased. You are a most loyal subject. She is small, a demure disposition that betrays her innocence. Yes, let us gather. I need to smell her, for that which glitters is not always gold. However, if she smells of corruption, then you will know my ire, Pilgrim. I promise you, oh so magnificent Griffin, she is pure. Wanna kiss Griffin? Want someone to stroke your fur, Griffin? Huh? Farewell, little dog. My Mara welcome your descent. Sir? What do you mean? Sweet love! written on in her taste. Traitor subject, I demand an answer. I beg you, hear me, Griffin. I was certain in her purity, sworn by his majesty himself. I plead forgiveness. Spare me and I will make amends. More tribute. Um, I will let you decide what they meant by the girl's purity yourselves. At this point in the story, we aren't really sure whether this is the actual Griffin that protects the kingdom, or just a rogue imitator that decided to come out of nowhere. But in the interest of not letting any more loose threads, I'm just gonna go ahead and spill it out. This is the actual Griffin who is the symbol of the realm, and much like the realm itself, he only looks majestic and beautiful. In reality, he is a greedy, selfish monster. He demands human sacrifices, and he helped wipe out an entire commune just because he didn't like their attitude. You can kill him right now, after one point he just leaves, but I'm pretty sure he'll come back eventually. From there, we go back to attend the meeting between the advisor and Mortifane, and it goes just as well as you would have imagined. Please, Mortifane, consider what you're saying. Did I grant you the luxury to interrupt? Trust me with my name again, and your neck will be kissing the axe. Yes. I am sorry, my lord. Then you advise her. Relay the message to that crone that if she dares poke her nose within Arnhemet again, her bridge will fall into the current below. Understood. I will part with your words so she can hear them. What just happened? Exactly what I expected. An attempt to squeeze blood from stone. Mordefane, in all his wisdom, has deemed it fit to sever ties with our neighbors. Now we wait for Morosa's response. And be assured it will not be pretty. All these years, when our lord has become even more bitter. He'll never forget what happened all those years ago. Was it her death? Or is it the state of this town? Both? Maybe this is a good time for Evermore to step in? Quiet! Have the sense not to call for such sabotage while we're watched. Hmm. Though your proposition brings another idea. And that is? Rumors have stirred about an important individual, a descendant of Mados, and from what we know, he resides not too far from the kingdom's capital. The hamlet nestled to the west of us, called Tabandra. And how is this important? Image, my friend. The armor we've maintained from Mados's fatal excursion still shows its majestic craft after all these years. Okay then, I'll seek him out. Evermore is a very welcome change of tone from the dreary scenery here. Been a long while since I've made the journey there myself. Hope you don't get too comfortable upon those lush knolls, though. We're pressed with an urgent concern. A gathering of witchmen to the north are engaged in some communion. Nothing before has been quite like it. And if whatever they conjure up comes marching down the valley, then we'll need all our allies. The journey to get to Rados is pretty long actually and takes us through a bunch of systems, but it's not nearly as long as the important stuff Rados has to tell us. 
So let's get right to them. You have to come with me. Have you heard about the Witchmen? Who hasn't? Why? They are ready to make a move on Armina. That actually sounds worthy of Mados. You know what? You're right. Last thing I want is to go down in history as Rados, twice as tall and twice as yellow as any. I'm in, friend. Lead the way. What was the reach before all this? The Witchmen, the Orcs? That's simple. There was no reach before that. The reach is and always has been its people. And the Reachmen haven't had a calm night in centuries. Orcs, Witchmen, Nords, Bretons. And it's not like the Bretons themselves get along. And I thought I left the civil war in Skyrim. You wish. There's a bleeding mess of a kingdom next to ours called Wayrest. And some 14 years ago we went to war with it. King Uta, also called the Owl. Wait, Owl? I know a few Owls. About three in particular. Uta had some beautiful daughters, you see. Each one from a different queen. And King Sigmain was quite fond of one of them. Something Uta wasn't too fond of himself. In the span of two weeks, more than a thousand men were dead on both sides. Such was the war over a princess's canny. Well, a beautiful woman is as good of a cause as any. Not when she's nine years of age. Oh. Damn near cost his majesty his head. During one of his visits, Uta had Sigmund taken prisoner, and his retainers banished from the kingdom. Did he escape? Aye, some weeks later. Small wonder he wanted to see Wayrest go up in flames after such humiliation. I was levied three days after, and a week later, the army was well on the move towards Wayrest. The trade had stopped, the crime ran rampant, and in the following years, not a corner remained in the entire realm that wasn't raided and sacked. Today, one of the base largest cities is not even worth conquering anymore, and half our military has to guard the border against those who blame Evermore. What was River Spring like before all this? Oh, none so unusual. There was even a joke that that's what you call a temple, a sewer and a wall brought together. However, there was a real sense of community. We were proud like the Reachmen should be. We are older than the three empires combined. Most of the world doesn't know we exist and the Britons want to believe we don't. Back then, Mortivane seemed like the finest lord the plagues had ever seen. Strict but fair, blunt but honest, a terrific swordsman on top of that. It's as if you're talking about two different towns. Well, the siege of Ravenspring had changed it all. Those two months broke some in ways healers could do nothing about. A hero's death. The doom of Grey Belmore. The bodies mounted on the pikes. My father couldn't handle Maddos' demise. Took to the bottle and in the following years there wasn't much left of him. And Mortifane had lost his wife. That alone had made a man once called Maid of Iron, fearful for his life, secretive and cruel. And soon he had the bodies on the pikes make a return. This new Mortifane could have been Maid of Iron alright, so many he had put to death with it. There is nothing else noteworthy here. There are two things I want us to take away from this dialogue. The Siege of Wayrus by the King of Evermore, and the, well, mental inaptitude of the King of Evermore, and the Siege of Riverspring by a bunch of orcs about 20 years ago, which apparently turned Morifei mad, with Rados we then go to stop the Richmen from attacking Armina by attacking them first. There's not much worth talking about here. I guess I can turn your attention to this totem that depicts two flames belonging to the Daedra these Witchmen worship. Something interesting, however, does happen when we exit the Witchmen's lair. When we exit the lair, we meet Jagos who has been attacking the Witchmen outside. Is there anything else? Contacted our friends in Evermore. They're gonna send these Stasi down to clean house. If you want a primer on who these criminals turned militia are, then we'll have to speak later. For now, make sure we haven't got some foul straggler lying in wait for their arrival. No better place than a giant hole to take a leak. And then the thing called Whisper we saw in the Daedra Realm comes out out of nowhere and attacks us. After we kill it, we have to go back to the priest and report this event, along with Jagos' suspicion that this is increasingly looking like one of Namira's handiworks. But before we do that, we can ask Jagos about who the Eustace are. And to spare the details, I'm gonna summarize by saying that the Eustace are a special militia deployed by the Kingdom of Evermore to do their handiwork. And despite the fact that they get the job done, they are an extremely corrupt organization, made up mostly of exiles, corrupt parts of the militia, and prisoners. When we talk to the priest back in Armina, he has this to say. We're not certain on which prince is involved, but we're certain that the involvement exists. Now we but to suss out which god schemes against us. With nothing more than circumstantial evidence, which may well fill this hall if it were written, we are most probably dealing with that dark mistress. Are you certain? 
There aren't many candidates that portray her influence among those pagan tribes, and Amira shows herself most through those hag ravens. I'm sure you've encountered them since your recent battle north. Was there something else? I must also ask you something. Please refrain from sharing the information you're about to hear with anyone else. Of course, your word is safe with me. When you departed to that den all those days ago, in pursuit of the Lord's amulet, did you feel anything strange emanating from it? Were there any markings on the item? Yes, the amulet had an inscription on it that said, May your stomach never sour. Stendar, protect us. I hope this is a coincidence and nothing more. It's all weaving together now, a clear tapestry. None of it was random. I must demand silence from you on this matter, lest we summon the blackest reaction from our lord. As Mordefane may be responsible for our interactions with the Witchman, we've now enough reason to believe that he's in concert with Namira. We shan't talk further. We'll only waste time and the threat of treason. We'll need to be swift and take action. Convene with the Archpriest of Evermore. He can be found within the temple there. We must hurry, as our king has sent forth men to oust Mordefane in response to this recent chaos. Like a lot of things, I will explain that whole may your stomach never sour thing later. This is the part where we go to Evermore officially. A lot of important side quests require we go to Evermore, but for the main quest, this is the point where we go there officially. Together, we have to do a quest for the guard, in which we learn the motives of those who had been exiled for being ill. Their demand is that the kingdom gives them some land in order to start their own commune isolated from the kingdom, and until the kingdom agrees to this, they're going to be hostile to it. But before we get to Evermore, I want to make a quick recap. There are a lot of enigmas that have been raised so far in the main story, but the main points are as follows. We went into the Adric Realm to pick up some gauntlets, and in Sir Realm, we found something called the Wayward Ego, and we have no idea what it is. We don't know the identity of the thief who stole the Divine Armor, and we don't know who the Wayward Brother is, or why he's a fleshless skeleton haunting the player. We also don't know who talked to us after we retrieved Morifei's medallion from the Witchmen. Why are the Witchmen digging up the Rainy Ruins? And finally, what is Namira's involvement in all this? In fact, now we know that Morifei has become a servant of Armina after a bunch of orcs laid siege to his city about 20 years ago. And if you think I'm jumping the gun with that one, then let me remind you that before the siege, that city was named Riverspring. But at some point after the siege, the city was renamed to Armina. And if you arrange the word Armina a little bit, you can kind of see what I'm getting at with this. I guess as a final point I want to make before we get to Evermore, is to remind you all that fundamentally, this is a tale of two mothers. The one we've always known is Mara, but the other one we just found out is Namira. But what exactly is the rivalry between them and how did it begin is still unknown to us. But with all that out of the way, let's finally get to Evermore. So when we go to Evermore, we have to talk to the Archbishop of the city. He says a lot of stuff, so I'm gonna speed around through the part about Morpheus and Namira's plot. It would be a great folly to continue dismissing it. There comes a time when the evidence transforms rumor to reality. Just the nature of her relation with Mortifane is a mystery. What could possibly be derived from that despairing entity? The priests have been worried about Daedric plots for some time, yet most were confined to individual victims. However, the reports we hold on Mortifane conform to a far grander scheme. A plot targeted at Adamantia itself. The Tower of the Dereni. It has many names, holding its own unique value to every culture. Now that tower happens to be one of the last, others across Temriel have since been destroyed or made dysfunctional. Compounded with the waning liminal barrier that separates us from oblivion itself, we have a recipe for disaster. It seems Martin's sacrifice 200 years ago did not make certain our survival. What are the towers? Pardon me. A week of thorough education would be needed to broach that subject. Such sheer complexity would surely distract us from this most urgent matter. What you need to know is that whatever is happening in Raven's Spring can spell a doom unseen since the beginning of our time. Worst comes to worst, we have a strategy to prevent complete chaos descending onto this kingdom. Knowledge from the Oblivion Crisis has been instilled in every priest's mind, in case it may ever transpire again. Anything else I should know? I shouldn't delay you any further. Horister was seen departing from Raven Spring with his party. They'll be convening with Morosa before ousting Mortifane from his throne. 
I'm so happy right now. We finally get to talk about the towers. You might remember the story of creation in which Lorcan was banished by Akatosh. However, the events that predated this action is where the first tower comes into play. You see, an event named the Convention occurred in which the Adra that helped create the world gathered together in the first traction of Nern, the Adamantia, and it is there that they decided the laws of this new world. Hence why Adamantia translates to Divine Law. And it is there that they also decided to get rid of Lorcan. And after a point they also decided to leave Mundus entirely because they had given up so much of their power to create the realm that had they stayed they would have surely perished. And so they left for Aetherius. This is a quote from the book Pocket Guide to the Empire 3rd edition. His story, of course, begins with creation. Sadly, all objectivity and solid evidence we require of other events in our records must be dismissed at this early point. Within each providence, each culture, each religion, each family, there exists a different understanding of how this world came to be. That said, one persistent story that is accepted by many cultures is that as the world congealed into reality, the gods made a great tower to discuss how to best proceed with the making of Mundus. The physical, temporal, spiritual and magical elements of Nern were set at this convention, and the tower itself remained behind even as some of the gods disappeared into Aetherius. Today, it is the Adamantine Tower, on the little island of Balfira between High Rock and Hammerfell, in the Iliac Bay. That such a humanoid structure remains the sole footprint of the Adra speaks perhaps of the essentially mortal nature of our world. This was the first tower, the Tower Zero. Other towers came about as either products of this tower, such as the Red Mountain and Snow Throat, or mortal limitations of the original tower, like the White Cold Tower, the Crystal Tower, or the Green Sap of the Wood Elves. There isn't a clear cut definition to what constitutes a tower, but they all have some similar traits which are, they cannot be used to harness incredible power, they all have or had some kind of stone in them, like the Heart of Transparent Law in the Crystal Tower and the Zero Stone in Adamantia, or cases like the Red Mountain and White Gold Tower, who have lost their stones. Lastly, they seem to have the ability to change reality itself, as the original tower is where the laws of reality were first set upon. The last four test games since Morrowind all have something to do with those towers, and I would be shocked if the Elder Scrolls 6 decided to step away from this pattern. Now, why did I mention all this? I mention all this because it's gonna be coming in very handy very soon. Now we have to go outside where there is a meeting going on between Marosa and Morife, and this happens. Where is he, priest? Pardon, our lord. A last minute detail within the manor. He'll be with us shortly. The Hagrius are ahead at last. So you finally had your way with the king. Why do you persist to harass me, Vulture? Horrister here will see to your death if you try anything rash, little lord. You have stained the kingdom of Evermore with your ill acts. Your capturing of trade goods and intimidation of merchants have brought ruin to your town and the Reach. Your rights as royalty are now forfeit. Ha! The audacity. You can place a new ass on that seat tomorrow, but the town itself belongs to no man now. Sigmane and the rest of the Reach now belong to her. To who, my lord? This madman has rambled long enough. Arrest him and bring him to trial in Evermore. My stomach reels at the sight of him. All of your stomachs were real when you see the lady, I assure you. I showed mercy upon you insects. I relented when the lady demanded this town. But I see the rats have bit the hand that feeds. You'll be the first to taste her domain, whore. Bastard! Don't let him run! Stand aside. Do you want this town to become a gauntlet for that insane lord? Nine lock my heart. The skies. What abyssal sorcery is this? What's that? I see you scum. On your own. What oh my you? You're slipping. Now I know you all think this is bad, but I can assure you, the worst is yet to come. So you get to Oblivion opens and a tower spawns out of nowhere, and the only way to stop it is to get in the Oblivion gate and remove the Sigil Stone, a la Test 4 style. Inside the portal, we are in Amira's realm of Oblivion, the Scuttling Void. There is this really long section about finding everyone who jumped into the portal or got sucked by it, and by the end of it we rescue a lot of the town's militia, Priest Matthew, Horatos and Jagos, and then we go in the tower to remove the Sigil Stone. There are 6 different floors to this tower, and the first 5 of them represent different main series Elder Scrolls games going in chronological order. The plug on the first floor says, First intervention of the interloper, a pursuit of renegade. The plug on the second floor says, To seek death in undeath, 
to revive the juggernaut. The third one says to seek the heart of the rogue god. The fourth one says to hold the red spill, to watch the dragon die. And the fifth one says to stop the cycle and leave better on the world eater's belly. Now the sixth one doesn't say anything about an Elder Scrolls game. It simply says to watch the world in its waning, to watch the dream become a nightmare. And when we touch the sigil stone, we found out the identity of the person who made these floors, who is also the person who first talked to us when we retrieved Modify's amulet, the last tyranny king. Who are you? Speak clearly. What are you talking about? What do you want? I think that a big point that a lot of people miss when we talk about the Elder Scrolls universe is that everything in this world is decaying, slowly and very painfully. And this decay has been observed by both Daedra, Aedra and mortals alike. The Red Mountain exploded, the Amulet of Kings is shattered, the last Dragonborn is born and his task is over, and the Daedra specifically are scared shitless of this concept of entropy. Not to say that the other beings aren't, but it is the narcissism of the Daedric Princess, along with the fact that they have never experienced decay before, that has made them extremely agitated by this concept of entropy. And so here Namira is trying to gain control of the Reach, to get to the tower that determines the divine laws, and erode existence so she can preserve herself as the creator of the next Kalpa. This is the exception to what I said at the beginning of the video when I said that this mod dwells into local issues and not so much cosmic ones. This quest feels like it should have been the conclusion, but it is far from it, and although we will We'll never interact with the last king again, this will not be the last time we will interact with the outcomes of his contract with Namira. Now, with all the deserved credit I have given this mod, I think it's also time to give it some smack. Because this quest is broken. This fight is supposed to play out in a way that involves hitting the hand of the king and breaking his shield while he teleports and attacks you. I have played this battle three times 
and each and every time he gains back his full health after teleporting. I am assuming that this is because a new model of the king comes out every time he teleports, and this model doesn't keep the stats of the original one. So everyone, I am sorry to say, but that was it. That was the full story of the Dragonborn. They went to Namira's realm in Oblivion, they met the last Ereni king, and they were locked in an eternal battle, as they have infinite healing power due to maxing out restoration. And the last Ereni king found the greatest weapon of them all, mistakes in modding. Or alternatively... Time to taste metal! <laughs> You know what? Whatever works, I guess. When we get out of there, there's a talk between the priest, Rados, and Horister. Jagos, however, did not make it out of there, and in fact, he doesn't show up for the rest of this mod, so I'm assuming he's gonna be part of a future update. That or he might just be dead, that works too. He did go in oblivion after all. Before we continue on from this section, I want to mention something. During the boss fight with the last king, we can find Morpheus' crispified body crying under a daedric altar, and in his inventory there is nothing but a piece of human flesh which simply reads, Belize. We learn who Belize is by talking to the town's undertaker, after he tasks us with sealing a grieving spirit that has been haunting his cemetery. Who is she? Belize's tale is out of tragedy, whose story still continues beyond her death with Mortifane being what remains of her legacy, despite how corrupted he's become. Thirty years has passed since that harrowing siege upon the town, spawn of the orc's malice, with the residents panicked and fearful, had locked themselves from their own produce. Starvation had run rampant through the town, with many succumbing to their famished conditions. Those in the manor, however, fared a great deal better than the lower folk, but from where? The siege occurred at the dawn of a new harvest. There was little food within the walls at the time, even for nobility. Just another secret that has yet to be uncovered. So now we know that Mortify sacrificed his wife to Namira and then ate her. But where did he find the sacrificial altar? There is no such date regard there in this city. Anyway, then we get narrated by the King of Evermore. He tells us about how important this is for him and his kingdom, blah blah blah. Kegor, who is the leader of the army, then gives us a checklist of things to do and we become an errand boy again. Two out of the three quests he gives us have nothing noteworthy about them. The third one, however, is one I want to focus on briefly. If you remember during the beginning of the Armina questline, I skipped over a quest that involved a bunch of Imperials regaining control of a fort that was conquered by the Sons of Orsinium. Well, in that quest, we rescue a woman that was forced upon by the orcs and was left with a child because of it. You you can tell why I sit this one out. Well, that commander tells us that that woman has now escaped and has gone on to find a mysterious witch to help her get rid of that child. And the reason why I'm mentioning this quest is specifically because of that witch. First of all, let's establish the most basic thing about her. She's a complete liar. She claims that she wants to help the woman get rid of her child, so she can raise it instead, and she gives us a recipe that supposedly allows the fetus to go from her mother's belly to hers. Now, there are some pretty wacky spells in the Elder Scrolls universe. However, to my knowledge, such a spell does not exist. And even if it did exist, I bet it wouldn't require... <clears throat> two death bells, two ectoplasm, and an urn root. Death bell? Wait, by Alessia's majesty, that's a damn recipe for poison. So we beat the witch up and then tell the woman, there, there, everything's gonna be alright, and then we go back to the Imperial Fort. However, before we do that, we get the option to talk to the witch about a very important topic. Pragmatic are the civilized. If you want a change in destiny, bring me flesh. That would serve some utility to those who just want results, yes? The skin of those you wish to mimic and are crafted onto your shape. A new identity will be birth. You can change how I look physically. Only the flesh. The mind is not of the same clay, so may find itself anchored to the past, despite best intentions. Though the body can open rooms of the mind, where they were once locked. Pleasure and pain being the first doors to loosen. Alleviating or exaggerating the carnal. But your deeper self, this will stay. Has anyone come to you recently asking for a body change? I find humor in the desperation of the civilized to escape their fates. One would think such a privileged lifestyle should back docility, content with your luxuries. Yet the deluge of souls who come for my services attest to a different world. One such recent arrival was a demon of translucent red, smacked of all the despairs of your society. His every fiber rebelled against the rigid hierarchy of your world and sought escape 
throwing vestiges of most regal flesh to my feet. I went to work, sewing and tearing where I needed. This man willed himself into a prince, and I had helped him on his path. Now the winds grow fierce, and the storm clouds gather. Monster will taste vengeance in its waning. So now the plot thickens. We now know that this witch was in Monster when was besieged, she can give people new identities with flesh magic, and she has apparently done so to a demon that wished to be a prince. Huh, I wonder if that's gonna come up. Son! My! How much you have changed in such short time! And how much wider you become. The chef must have been busy. The messages told of you returning with Elaine. I feel like this guy might not be entirely legit. But anyway, what was the king talking about when he was saying something about some children? Oh, he wants us to pick some children from Armina to take them back to Evermore so he can protect them from the plague. After we deliver the children to the archbishop, he tells us that we should go watch a speech given by a leader at Orc from Daggerfall, and so we go ahead and do just that. His entire speech boils down to, look, we all keep killing each other, how about instead of doing that, we don't do that? Huh? Huh? You all ever thought about that? And everyone still gives him shit for it. He also requests that the orcs be allowed to make a new Orsinium. Um, if that Orsinium is ever built, it's gonna get raised. And then at some point during his speech, this happens. Until we can live side by side. Trouble in the brothel? Halt this speech! We need everyone to vacate the area! Come now, prepare to get busy. In the brothel, a worker there tells us that a bunch of women were mercilessly and savagely killed by an unknown entity, and we chase after that entity through the system, and although it escaped, it left behind two important things. At the scene of the crime, we find the eye used by the witchman, and in fact we also saw this eye outside the room of the thief when we were chased by the wayward brother. Secondly, a beggar at the system managed to have a look at the beast who did this, and she describes it as something big and red, with blonde hair, and covered in blood. Kegos then tells us to take the symbol of the eye we found on the torn flesh, and take it to the missionary so he can use alteration magic, and show us the source of this creature. While we wait for the missionary to finish his spell, we can go to Prince Damien to do some work. The following quest we embark on is completely optional, but I want to at least summarize it, because in it, the prince finds a way to stop and cure the curse in Grey Balmor. You know, that haunted Dereni settlement that was cursing the land. You know, that one. And despite even the counsel of the Imperial Commander we found previously, Damien goes ahead and leads the army personally to dispel the curse. I think that we have well established at this point, at least subliminally so, that Damien is the demon we found in the Dwemer Ruin. But he is not exactly a bad guy. In fact, he seems to really care about the kingdom. And even Priest Matthew seems to view him as a figure of hope. He also isn't playing with Namira like Morifei did, because he just dispelled one of her curses. So, what's the deal with him? To find the answer to this question, we need to go back to the missionary. My exercise led me to the long-since-abandoned facility up in the mountains, unfortunately bearing the recent moniker of Rejects Respite, in light of the types of people who were brought there. Following that arcane scent more closely, I was brought to the bowels of that ruin. Never thought it to be that extensive. Okay, now we have to go to the Rejects Respite, but before we get there, I want to mention that despite the little coverage I found about this mode online, the little discussions I was able to find usually throw their hands at the air at this point. There are quite a few things going on in the Rejects Respire, and it doesn't really help that this place isn't voice acted, but don't worry, I will be reading the lines and explaining everything as we go. And let this section be my evidence as to why I am not willing to cover Glenn Morrill and Unslad until they are done. And voice acted. So Rejects Respire is an asylum where a lot of experiments took place on the human anatomy and the human soul by Dr. Mengrele. For reference, this doctor is inspired by the real-life doctor of the German fascist regime, Joseph Mengel, which tells you all you need to know about this guy. I read from his diary. We must look to the past to answer questions regarding the perfect slave, one content with his servitude and gracious enough to his master. Yet I've seen resentment of all enslaved races for their chains, no matter the year. Even with the Elliot, having forgone making a slave able to do anything other than horrify. Yes, they had succeeded in subduing their cattle, but not in the way we want. I had hoped that the orcs would respond well to the most recent serum, and some of them do, but the rest of them go feral, tearing at themselves until blood loss takes them. Yet we work with those who made it, a sort of survivorship bias. Now they will be the foundation for the true slave. So with the use of these experiments, Mangrele was able to make two discoveries, and we know this because he shows up at the end of the mod to talk about them, but by that point they're not really that relevant and he's not even voice actor and also there'll be other things to talk about by then so I thought I should just mention them here and get them over with. Firstly, he managed to create an extremely deadly serum which can quote-unquote pacify the witchmen and the orcs if mass-produced 
And secondly, he figured out how to examine and mutilate souls so he can create the perfect slave and to fix the undesirables of the kingdom, such as slaves, whores, beggars, and other general poor people. You know, he could have spent this time to maybe do something else like curing the actual illness that has been plaguing the land, but instead he did this. What a guy. This is, however, not the only thing that happened in the respite. I will now read the three journals of the mortal war porter that can be found in the asylum. Journal number one reads, If anyone finds this, then this pit has taken me. It is the fate I deserve for not fighting against the evil here. Signs so wretched that even these witchmen would reel in all. The surgeons are slipping further into madness, repeating twisted words on their chopped lips. Their pale skin becoming almost ghost-like, see-through, against the fires of the common room. All of them together silent, as if the ceremony had chucked its occupants. The second journal reads as follows. You never get used to the smell. Worst by the day. There is a source to it. I know it. But that area is accessed by the master surgeon and his trusted associates. If there was work outside, I would leave. But there is nothing. And if I failed to bring that coin, then my family would stay within the reach. Within Mortifane's reach. Just a few more weeks and I'll be off to Daggerfall. But I fear that the memories left here won't be so easily left behind. And finally, the third journal reads, I have been permitted to the lower world. They say I'm trusted. What a mistake my eagerness to please was. There is a scream behind the wall. A wailing. It doesn't stop. The surgeons have left the halls and I am here to clean up the mess. But I am not alone. There is a screaming at the end of this hall. So I turn another corner. Just a few more days and I will be off to Daggerfall. It is nothing, I'm sure. The patients must have escaped, but I am supplied with salt, and they are nothing but famished victims of this tyranny. I feel this holes have become narrower. So, what happened here? Well, to figure that out, we need to read the journal of the mortal world surgeon, Namira. It's startling to know that there has been one god who's reigned throughout every age of the reach. Other gods have made their attempts to influence this realm, but this god is chief among them. From the aliens to the witchmen, some say her influence penetrates deeper still. Those who speak such rumors know nothing we do here, for we know her and have seen her. For all our crimes, we act as a bulwark against her, to prevent her roots from spreading into this world. There are two last notes by the surgeons of this asylum. One of them talks about the serum and the solgenics that were conducted here, and it's really not that important, so we're gonna skip that one. But the other one talks about a very peculiar patient, and I'm gonna read it when we actually get to meet that patient, or at least we meet what's left of him. So what else was happening in this asylum that had everyone silent every time they entered the common room? Well, when we enter the lower level of the asylum, we are given a quest called... Um, wait a minute. Gestalt. We are given a quest called Gestalt. Immediately upon entering, the ghostly apparitions of the patients that used to live in this facility tell us to set them free or to run away before the meat consumes us. And they also advise us that should the meat come for us, we should use the stuff given to us by the missionary to prevent it from eating our soul. In the common room we see a barren effigy of Ner. Not Nern, Ner. And inside it there is a Daedric heart. We then traverse through the asylum and find a fragmented skull, which if we bring back to the effigy, the patient tells us that the meat seeks to escape and swallow the whole world, and that once we release it, we have to kill it. And then this happens. And when we kill it, the souls of the patients are set free. Before they leave, they leave us the key to go even lower in the asylum, but they warn us that the meat has not been killed. It has only been weakened, and it is now falling asleep. I understand that I keep ranting on and on about concepts that haven't been explained yet, but I cannot for the life of me explain what the meat is without mentioning a few other things. And to explain those things, we have to keep playing. So don't worry, everything you saw here will be explained further below the asylum. Deeper into the respite, we find the same eye we found on the corpses of the woman that brought us here to begin with, as well as the room that they practice soldenics. And before we know it, big wayward brother comes out to play. To stop him, we need to go to the patient's rooms, and at the end of that corridor, we need to pull the lever that opens their doors. And then we pass out, but not before a voice tells us to rise and forget. The ugly dreams that frighten you so. The rooms of the patients themselves aren't really that important. This is more or less Skyrim's version of the SCP Foundation. Well, save for one room that is. The meat. The inscription on the room of the meat simply says as follows. Only open if subject breaches door. If growth is found beyond door, resort to incendiary precautions. This is the meat. Well, we obviously know this by that point. But beyond these rooms, a cave opens up, and in it we find the answers to several of our questions. This takes us to a massive cave system inhabited by witchmen, and in the center of it is an abandoned altar dedicated to Namira. There are a lot of entry points to this place, and each one represents a different party that has sought to find this place and break a deal with the Daedric Prince. This is the altar under which Morphe killed and ate his own wife, 
a person hanged himself so he can gain Amira's favor, and it is also the place the first one of the rich found, which turned them into the witchmen they are today. What seems to have happened here is that after they were massacred in Monster, they began escalating their violence as a countermeasure to the horrors inflicted onto them by the nobility, and so they found this place, and it is here that they made a bargain with Namira for more power. With a blessing, they created several cursed amulets one of whom was given back to Morifane. So the question here becomes something like, who made this elaborate altar to a Daedric prince to begin with? Well, why should I explain that when Mara herself comes down and throws some sweet exposition down our way? I will let the queen take it away. The history of hate in your land traces its roots here, where the seed planted by the begotten king had fermented and grown, the branches tearing through the earth and penetrating all life above. Witchmen, those misguided souls stolen from my grace, were molded in the shape of this foul king's form. I did not reach them in time, and in turn, another mother had taken my place. Where I had hoped to impart a will to live in them, that mother had brought an antithesis, preying on their fears and animosity, and exaggerating these insecurities to heights unforeseen. And so, the same tragedy that played the Witchman finds itself repeating with you and those behind their walls. A schism forms between those who are wanting and those who are rich. Material, beauty, and status, all thanks to the divine. I am burdened with the curse of prescience, prescience of tragedy, and I weep. You will talk with a soul who was beholden to ultimate misfortune. I was too late to help him. Feel sympathy for his plight, but do not let his spoiled tongue coerce you to committing evil. I just wish I could have saved him, if only I was stronger. Tell him I am sorry, though I'm afraid any apologies are too late. This is where the origins of Namira's influence on this land begin. The last Tyranny king made this place, and it is here that he made a pact with her, and as a product of that pact, the meat was created, with the end goal of spreading throughout the land and eventually conquering Adamantia. But why wouldn't Namira just come herself a la Molak Bolor Merun's Dagon style? Why would she make a pact with someone and produce an easily, or at least mostly easily, containable root? And what is the wayward brother? And what is the purpose of the meat? And who is the wayward ego? The answers to all the questions left are hidden behind the last character of this mod that has yet to be introduced. Which is perfect, because he is also the most important character in this entire story. The Wayward Husk. When Mara drops us, we end up back in Namira's realm of oblivion, but this time, we're not alone. After a quick walk, we stumble upon a large tower, and inside said tower is the Wayward Husk. I need to give a quick heads up, this guy is about to give us a really long monologue that goes on for about 10 minutes, and I am not a fan of having NPCs talk for that long, but it is absolutely necessary to understand what this guy is saying, as he's about to spill the beans per se. So for this instance, I'm gonna let this one play. However, if at any point you find his voice annoying, and I'll give it to you, it is not an easy voice to follow through, here's a timestamp. And if by the end of the dialogue you still have a bunch of question marks in your head, don't worry, I will explain everything. Here is where we begin. In this perfect absence, two beings live with no knowledge of the other, no knowledge of themselves. Tranquil and definite was this. So tempting was its silence, and so it was befallen, the dirt had came. She appeared, shattering the nothing, or oh, she brought vision, or oh, she brought sound. In our words, she brought a medium. In this sudden immediacy, Recognition and the first ones. And so the two inert beings from black awoke to our summoning. The original drama, the first impulse. They sought her heart. Yet two. Shut 
Did you guys miss me? I certainly did. So what was all that? What the Hus just talked about was the legend of creation, and more specifically, the story of the first conflict. The two men in the story is Anu and Parume, or as you may know him as, Sethis, and the woman was Ner, and the child she made with Anu was Nern, aka the Elder Scrolls universe. This happened even before Lord Kanenaketosh became a thing, this is the first power struggle, and Ner was the first medium, the first thing that was finite yet desirable by more than one, and it is in the image of this conflict that existence was made. Here is an excerpt from the book The Anandated Anuat. The first ones were brothers, Anu and Parume. They came into the void, and time began. As Anu and Parume wandered the void, the interplay of light and darkness created Ner. Both Anu and Parume were amazed and delighted by her appearance, but she loved only Anu, and Parume retreated from them in bitterness. Ner became pregnant, but before she gave birth, Parume returned, professing his love for Ner. She told him that she loved only Anu, and Parume beat her in rage. Anu returned, fought Parume, and cast him outside time. Ner gave birth to creation, but died from her injury soon after. After many ages, Parume was able to return to time. He saw creation and hated it. He swung his sword, shattering the twelve worlds in their alignment. Anu awoke and fought Parume again. The long and furious battle ended with Anu the victor. He cast aside the body of his brother who he believed was dead and attempted to save creation by forming the remnants of the twelve worlds into one, Nern, the world of Tamriel. As he was doing so, Parume struck him through the chest with one last blow. Anu grappled his brother and put them both outside of time forever. The blood of Parume became the Daedra. The blood of Anu became the stars, the mangled blood of both of them became the Aedra, hence their capacity for good and evil, and their greater affinity for earthly affairs than the Daedra, who have no connection to creation. It is such an amazing way, I think, to rationalize what is happening now in the Reach by creating this allegory with the first conflict in existence and the power struggle of the two first entities. 
And just to make one thing clear, this story isn't to be taken at face value. If it were, then that would mean that the two first brothers had a child together and they both fell in love with that child. But the child only ended up loving one of them. This story also comes into conflict with other myths of creation. Most strikingly, it mentions that the stars were made by the blood of Anu, but in a lot of other stories, the stars were a product of the age of living Mundus before they give up too much of the power, thus leaving a bunch of holes in the realm upon their departure. So, which story is true? Maybe both? Maybe it's a bit of one and a bit of the other. Maybe it's neither. You are two hours in in a video about Elder Scrolls lore. Do you really believe in linear storytelling or reliable narrators? I don't think you do. Okay, that's good and all, but back to the mod. We wake up in the Imperial camp and we learn that the Imperials are planning to leave this area due to how quieter everything seems to be ever since we pushed back the orcs and Damien stopped the curse of Grey Balmor. In fact, I've heard Sigmund's son, Damien, may just be the lord that breaks the cycle. We can only hope. Such a merciful and boisterous leader may bring those sad sods out of their depressive stupor. Word is he's soon to give a speech to the people in Ravenspring. May want to go over there and see what he has to say. So we go listen to Damien's speech and uh, yeah, he actually cares about these people. He encourages them, he shows them mercy, he wants them to prosper and to be happy, and he's willing to kill every single orc in the land to do so. Okay, so he's almost perfect. I see, I see a few problems regarding his foreign policy. After his speech, Priest Matthew has something to tell us about Damien. It's about what the missionary saw when he scoured that damn facility in the mountains. Or rather, what he's seen now that made him evoke such dread. The prince, Damien, had entered the temple to greet us. Almost immediately did the missionary become capricious. I thought it was fatigue from the exercise, but he was extremely pallid. I've never seen such a drastic turn of health so quickly. Where is the missionary now? I've sent him off to the Divide, where Fennig, the town's priest, will look after him. He is young, and the events that transpired here have probably overwhelmed him. Hey dude, how are you? A tad better than what I was back there, that's for sure. However, I feel as though my body is still in shock. Damien, yes. What a dreadful sight. I thought it was some elaborate ruse, some twisted jest. Yet, no one was laughing. No one in the temple even batted an eye at the state of Damien. The priest said you collapsed after you saw Damien. His veneer was torn apart. Like some beast had worn a suit of flesh. Oh, I think he's on to us. Now we have to go meet Damien at the Quarry Outpost. And... It's endings time. So outside the outpost, we can find a projection of the husk, and he's willing to spill out everything to us, but in the most cryptic and lengthy way anyone could possibly come up with. There is easily about an hour's worth of dialogue here, and I'm not going to go through all that again, so I'm just gonna summarize everything as best as I can. So first and biggest question, wayward husk, wayward ego, wayward brother, who exactly are they? Well, the story of the husk, and again, this is all being said very cryptically, so if I get something wrong, I did my best. But the story of the husk seems to be that he was once a man born from a Breton and an orc. When he was young, he looked just like any other Breton, and he lived in their society for all of his life. Yet as he grew older, he began displaying more and more orcish characteristics. When the people of his society figured out that he was a halfling, they didn't like that one bit, and they began humiliating him from his nature, which included beating him up, casting him away, and worst of all, one day, a group of Eustace castrated him. Bleeding and isolated, he went to the witch that can reshape flesh, and she promised to help him if only he brings her the flesh of his brother, and he did just that, and the witch did in fact help him. She built him a new body of a pure Breton, but with one caveat, the PB stays off. My focus was captured by one call, born of my trials. To go beyond the flesh, to be a Breton again, brother, dear brother, it was not yours to suffer my wants, it was mine, the ritual demanded your flesh, brother, lasted for your agony. He even joined the Eustace. You know, the people that turned him into a eunuch? Yeah, he ended up joining them. But then, the Siege of Wayrest happened, and he was sent there along with the rest of the Eustace. One thing I omitted mentioning so far is that when Wayrest fell, it wasn't exactly pretty. We haven't covered him yet, he comes up after this, but the leader of the Eustace isn't exactly a good guy. Or, as a glimmer of foreshadowing, he isn't exactly a guy at all. This guy figured out that a member of the Eustace had no genitals, and just to make fun of him, he beat him almost to death and left him alone in the ruins of Wayrest. 
the witch just so happened to be passing by the ruins of the city and she fixed him once again, this time for free using the many corpses around them. And after his fixing, he was extremely weak. It was there that a group of surgeons found him in the ruins of Wayrest and took him to a place called the Rejects Respite. I'm reading from the last part of the surgeon's journal that I didn't read while we were there. We've been saddled with four more recruits for this month's itinerary, inducted by Mangrela himself. They are responsible for the most recent patients. Save one. They retrieved him, her, from the siege of Wayrest. It seems to be made up of distinct bredic tissue. We have attempted to do similar in the past, but the mixing of blood types has led to the immediate demise of the patients. There has been discussion that this was the result of the hedge witch. The patient has not moved or eaten since its arrival, but there is something indescribable in the room with him whenever we observe through the door slit. Our attempts at seeing this entity up close has failed every time. The entity, as it turns out, is what remains of his brother, who follows him around. Not so much haunting him, more so haunting everything around him, and then him, thus becoming the wayward brother. In the respite, they were also experimenting with the outcomes of the pact between Namira and the last Tyranny king. They saw the mid attempted to grip and corrupt the effigy of Ner, and it is there that they realized what this thing truly was. It wanted to make Ner in the image of Sithis, which is why it has a Daedric heart in it, despite Ner going for Anu. The meat is Namira's attempt to feed the world to her wounded father, while also helping her to spread her influence to the Mancia and gain control of the tower so she can preserve herself in the next Kalpa. Out of everything in this video, there are some small details about the husk story that I'm not super confident about. P.S. He's not really the husk yet, but we don't know his real name, so I just keep calling him that. I am not sure what were the circumstances that led to him escaping, but what I am sure is that he did escape. And after being there for so long, he was influenced by Namira, and she told him to grab the Adric artifacts of Maros, which were blessed by Mara, and bring them to her realm, of which she brings the gauntlets, but he leaves behind the ring. He uses the gauntlets to open a long forgotten oblivion portal to Namira's realm, which was once used by the Dwemer, and in that realm, he dies as the wanting stillborn, and he's reborn as two parts the wayward ego and the wayward husk. The husk maintains some of the personality traits of the original person, but the wayward ego wants nothing to do with his past, and he is blindly contrarian to it. His past self was an orc, he hates orcs. His past self hated royalty and beauty, he wants nothing more than to be of royalty and spread beauty. His past self started serving Namira, he hates Namira. You and I will destroy the dark mother together. Goodness and beauty will prevail. The only thing he has in common with his past self is his adoration for the Bretons. The ego wants what the original person can never have, to be a beautiful Breton, and it is the fact that the original person can never have that that drove it to become a disgusting monster, who even went as far as to kill his own brother for it. But it is important to remember that the husk and the ego are still connected in some ways, because it wasn't the ego who wanted the woman on the brothel to die that day, rather it was the hatred of the husk that possessed him and made him kill them. And what is more, if one of them dies, so does the other. So why did a random guy go through all this? Well, the husk mentions that he was chosen for this task as part of the deal struck between the last Trenny King and Namira, and that even before his birth, every single action he would take in life was already decided for him, hence why he was called the Wanting Stillborn. A ritual was to take place. Prying fingers stepped into your world, and the jewel of dark divine gave me destiny. Someone, something was in control. Through him the king could listen, hear and pursue his project of invading Nern and gaining control of the tower, but we stopped him dead in his heels in Armina, which is why we can hear the husk talking to us after we remove the sigil stone. This was my best attempt at making heads or toes of the story of the ego, the husk and the brother. I am mostly confident in it, but there are some nitty little greedy things that I'm still not so confident about. So if you have any Beyond the Edge experts out there, I want to hear your opinion in the comments. As I said, there isn't much written about this mod's lore online, so largely I had to piece this all together. So if I made any mistake, please feel free to correct me. Now 
while the husk advises us to go kill the eco dressed up as the prince and the head of the U stays along with him. If we refuse to do so, we're taken to a conference between the prince, the leader of the U stays called Predator, Mangrele the doctor who was leading the research in the rejects respite, and Josiah who really isn't that important for this story. Here you have a few chances to deny the prince on what he stands for, and if you keep going along with everything he says, and letting the go faster so to speak, then he tasks you with killing the orc from Daggerfall that gives the speech about unity and peace, along with everyone who's with him. If we choose to do so, we will find out that the orc was accompanied by the priest Matthew, the blind priestess and her bodyguard we found at the beginning of the mod, and a wagon rider. And because we're feeling extra evil today, we will kill all of them and take their heads off. We bring those heads back to the prince, and he tells us that we're a very very good boy, and that he has no more work for us. And yeah, that was one of the two endings. And notice how I'm just calling them endings and not good ending and bad ending, because the second ending, as we will see, is both better and worse than this one in some respects. If at any point during the time we meet Damien and Bradathor we attack them, or we reject their rhetoric, we'll have to fight them. At that time, the Griffon that attacked the girl all that time ago comes back to attack the player. After we kill Damien, he spawns again in his true form, and after we finish him off along with the Griffon, we have a chance to finish off Bradathor for good. However, Bradathor reveals himself as a Deja of Merun's Dagon that invaded Tamriel during the Oblivion Crisis, and he teleports us back to his master's realm for a final showdown. We kill him there, and then we go back to the overworld. But not before the husk calls us back to Namiro's realm for one final chat. What happens to you now? The ego is undone. What remains comes this way. To make the husk call again before its final death. Learn away it. The ego will win over in the interstice after reconstitution. Where should I go? True that door. And now the husk is free to die, after several lifetimes of misery, betrayal, persecution, and daedric schemes of whom he had no influence over. One thing I failed to mention when I was talking about the husk story is that there are some inconsistencies in the timeline. And I think that part of the reason for that is that the mod suggests that time in daedric realms passes way slower than time in the real world. So here for example, we have been in daedric realms for about 20 minutes tops, yet in the overworld it's been two full weeks. In that time, the death of the prince and the disappearance of the leader of the Eustace have brought complete chaos to the rich, and the witchmen along with the orcs have smelled blood in the water, and so they have begun assaulting Evermore, and the peasants finally got a chance to overthrow their PDF file king. Speaking about the king, I should mention that we spawn behind a locked room right next to his throne, in which he has a bunch of baths, and the servants of those private baths are the children we rescued from the plague back in Armina. So here we have the option to either kill or team up with Kegor, depending on how high our speech is, and then we kill the king. Again when we attempt to leave, we get teleported to the Scarlet Invoin one last time, and this time, the scene is completely different. The husk is dust, and behind it, there is a burning effigy of the Griffon which symbolizes the rich. The rich is burning to ashes, but behind the Griffon, we can find Mara. We tried, and will keep trying to stem the tide of horror. But the hearts of mortal agents are locked in struggle, their souls tandem with fragility. Swaths of individuals seeking to covert their being had given rise to the terrific scenario you've seen. We need to go back and salvage what little hope there is, lest the Dark Mother has her feast. After that we leave the realm and we end up back in the castle, but this time there is no more siege. No, now the city is getting raised. We find our way out of the city and we get this weird, long, and I mean very long, cutscene of a girl called Dawn running away from the rich man and coming to Evermore to seek help but instead, she finds only us. Together with her, we go back to the divide where the defenders have set up well fortified positions, and she gets to reunite with her aunt. In the divide, we also get to see a lot of other people we met throughout the mod, and they are all in a very, very bad mood, because they got to see an entire kingdom fall. Rados decides that he is not an actual warrior like his grandpa, and decides to get drunk instead. Horister reflects upon the story of Maros while paying respects to the dead, and the missionary realizes how helpless the people of the rich truly are. Even the merchant from the beginning of the mod is here. In one last attempt to salvage what little is left, we help a band of orcs live through the divide for new lands. We then hop on the same wagon we came from and we go back to Skyrim. The rich is in ruins, Namira didn't get her way, the last king didn't get his way, the ego didn't get his way, but so did no one else. The end.
For me, these two endings show the forms of hope displayed by the people of the rich. In one of them, you commit to the dysfunctional system of the land and pray that things change because you are afraid of what might happen should the kingdom fall into corruption and disarray. Things might get better if you commit to the status quo, but at what cost? Killing everyone that doesn't like you and having demons as your commanders that are completely fine with turning on you and killing you after you don't do one of their biddings. In a sense, the first ending is hope but it is a hope deprived of freedom and self-agency. In the second ending, we gain back self-agency and oppose the wrongdoings of the kingdom. And for that, the kingdom crumbles and collapses. But through all this, hope lives on, through the children, the residents that will survive, and the people who will no longer have to suffer under the oppression of the kingdom of Evermore. I guess one could say that this is the dawn of a new hope. And that hope is that in the long term, the rich will be able to rebuild itself with better loss, and I don't know, maybe not a demon for a prince and a PDF file for a king. And this is where the mod ends. Thank you for watching this video. It was a long one, I know, I hope it was worth it. It certainly was a ride for me. This video was especially hard to make for a couple of reasons. Firstly, this mod can be extremely unpolished sometimes, especially near the end, not much is voice acted, and so I had to pause the recordings I was making for this video to see what they were actually saying. It was also kind of difficult to decipher the background of the husk, he says a lot in a very little time period, and what's more is that he speaks in a very cryptic manner, and I think that the timeline I presented for this video is as good as I can think of. If anyone has any objections to it, or if they observe something that I missed, then please let me know. But anyway, this mod is pretty good, and you should play it. I want to say that there's about 30% of this mod that I didn't cover, so take that 30% and run wild with it. Plus, this mod is still getting updated, so there will be more content to come. I will also leave the patron of the mod that brought us this incredible mod in the description below. And with all that being said, video 